As communicators, you have to communicate in weird situations very often. So I always come with fail safes and, and plan Bs, right? And that's always good to have. So brought my iPad, it has a hotspot capability, so I could use the LTE when the Wi-Fi is bad. I came in this morning, Wi-Fi is not so hot in here. Most of my presentation is internet-based. It's not an excuse for me to go, well, boo boo, hotel Wi-Fi, I can't do my presentation. So preamble. Other preamble, this Grid It by Cocoon, this is an awesome tool. If you're a communicator, you should probably have one in your bag. Have all the dongles for the different situations you might walk into. And this has bailed me out many, many times. Have an Ethernet cable, whatever cables to get the DVI, VGA, HDMI, whatever, whatever you might need. It's not very big, can go in your bag and it'll bail you out of tons, tons of situations. So that's, that's my, my, my pitch for the, uh, for the Grid at Cocoon. It's very cool. G-R-I-D dash I-T, Cocoon, uh, search for Ron Howard. 1984 movie and you'll get the spelling of Cocoon. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk about communication technology, what's new uh, and what's changed. Like Will said, this will be kind of drinking out of the fire hose. I'm pretty open, so if you have any questions, feel, feel free to throw them at me. And there'll be a, a number of demos in here to kind of, kind of show how these technologies I'm talking about work. So kind of what's changed the future. Last year I mentioned I had a, had a son, Blaze. He's now 18 months old. He's a very interesting guy. He's, he, can't, he can't talk. I mean, he, he can say help and mom and dad, but he can use an iPad. Not like he can klutz around with an iPad. He can turn it on, he can unlock it. He can swipe, he can go to his app, launch it, use his app, finish using the app and say all done when he's, when he's done with the, with the iPad. So kids, before they can speak and communicate, on the verbal level are able to take part in electronic technologies. What does that mean? I don't know. I just think it's cool, so I wanted to share it, share it with you. Yeah, and, and his mom dresses him, so he's a super cool dress kid. So what's the, what's the future focus for the city of Round Rock? Last year and for the past couple of years, I've been talking about social, location, and mobile. The other session going on right now is uh, uh, social Media 201. I'm going to cover Social Media 301 maybe <laughs> in a little, little part here. But these are the technologies that we focus on. Who, here, who in here has a smartphone? That's almost a cliche question, right? Everybody's hand goes up. You don't even need to ask it anymore. Pretty much everybody in a professional scale has a smartphone. Um, and how many people use social media technologies? Again, pretty much everybody's hand goes up. These aren't new technologies anymore. Uh, they're becoming mature and we're learning new ways to, to use them, but sometimes the platforms change, right? So we went from Friendster to MySpace to Facebook. Now there's kind of Twitter and Google Plus is in the mix. How many of y'all have been using Google Plus? So a couple, less than half. How many people are using Google Plus for your community in any form? So nobody's hand goes up. We've kind of been doing a, a, a skunk works test of using Google Plus, not putting out a whole lot of information. We just claimed our page so we could get, you know, plus.google.com slash city of Brown Rock so we could kind of squat on the name. If it took off, we didn't have to have to mess with any of that stuff. Um, and let me give you a quick demo of Google Plus. Are y'all interested in seeing that? Any of this stuff I can, I can skip or I can come back to. My, my first indicator for Google Plus is it's pretty much like Facebook. If you're using Facebook, it's, it's, it's very similar to Facebook. It, not in terms of the community or the way, way it works, but in terms of the controls that you'll have as a government entity. So follows the same paradigm where you have a personal account, right? And then you create your organization's account, and that organization's account can have managers and editors and all of those other, other functions. So here I'm logged into my personal account. We're going to switch to use the City of Round Rock page. Okay, that looks pretty good up there. So now we're logged in as City of Round Rock. So even just as doing this as a small, not marketing it, not really putting it out there and sharing, we have 151 pluses on this page. 151 people have found this information. We kind of, every now and again, I pop in and post a PSA or some information on some things we're doing, not really engaged at any sort of significant level. We have 151 pluses on this page. 100 people have us in circles. Uh, circle, are you all familiar with the circle on Google Plus? You can kind of make your groups of people that you like, so we have been put in those circles. 
I have been going back and adding the people that are obvious residents or social media experts or whatever and putting them into, into our circle. So I'll show you what a circle looks like. So here's Sid Burgess. He works for U-Town, so he's kind of in the same, same form, kind of looking at what cities are doing with Google+. So we have him in the social media folks circle. He's not a resident, he's not an employee, he does social media stuff. So you can put people into these buckets, which is really cool. When you put them into those buckets and you want to send out communication to them, you could send out information to the people that are social media mavens and not to all of your, all of your, res, uh, to all of your residents or employees. So here you have the, the share box, which is very similar to what you'd see on Facebook. You click on it, and then you see your to section here. And that's where we could go. I just want to send a message out to employees. So here's the employees that have circled us on Google+. Select them, and now that message will only show up in their timeline. So you have a little bit more granular control over who you're communicating with. Very, you know, there's obvious integrations to the other Google products, so it's very easy to post a YouTube video. So if we wanted to do, uh, Brian, tell me a video you recently did. Do the Loctite Hide. OK. It'll do a search. There's Loctite Hide. Click it, add video, and you know, within a couple seconds, you can send that video out to employees that have uh, circled you on Google+. So I'm not going to get too in deep into it. I just wanted to kind of show you it's there. And, and show you, you know, not so much metrics, but you know, we're getting pluses, and so this is probably something that we're gonna start to pay a little bit more attention to into the future. Yes, OC. Are you, is, is there a way to describe people that have found you and are using Google Plus? Are they more connected? Are, are you, what do you determine about this population that have found you guys? Yeah, so we haven't, I haven't looked into it that deep. But I, but I will say that a number of people, when we would post something, and let me see if I can find the comment. Here we go. Here's one from Laura Arias. We would like to see more by Round Rock on Google+. That's a, that's a citizen requesting more information through this platform to get information about the government. So I mean, that's anecdotal, right? It's not statistical. But there's people there that are, that are asking for the information. Um, who, who here has a, has a Twitter page for their community? Most, most people, right? Google Plus is a larger social network than Twitter. They're second in the United States to Facebook so in terms of number of people. Now, another thing to, to talk about is don't think of Google Plus as a place. Think of it as a platform. Google is building this as a social layer across maps, across all of their, all of their services, across you know, Gmail and, and so forth. So there could potentially be a lot, of, a lot of power to this platform. That's why it's growing so fast. And in a second here, I'll show you how your community has probably dozens of pages that are tied into Google Plus right now, and you don't know about it. So it's probably going to be time to pay a little bit more attention to Google Plus as a platform. Take a step back for one second. Last year, for those that attended, I talked a whole lot about maps. And guess what? I'm going to talk a whole lot about maps again this year. Love maps. And it fits in great with kind of the uh, mobile and location pieces of, of kind of what my push and, and my drive are. So this year, we, we tried to eat our own dog food. Showed you some demos last year of some things that could be done. And so we pushed for the past 12 months to release uh, our online GIS mapping system that worked on smartphones, that worked on tablets, and worked on desktops, and had really uh, rich features. So we uh, launched City View a couple months ago, and we uh, won a Government Excellence Award. It's the first IT award that we've won in the city of Round Rock. We won for City View mapping application. So I want to show you real quick what City View looks like and how it works. So our goal was to create an interface that's very, uh, very much standard to what you would see if you went to like a Bing Maps or a Google Maps. Lots of times when you would log into a GIS system, there'd be like a page before you got in that explained like this 1980s hand and this little crosshair tool and a magnifying glass kind of thing. Disclaimer on how slow it would be. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and uh, grab a cup of coffee because this is going to take forever to get any data out of it and you're going to be confused as hell and no one's going to use it. Other than that, welcome. Other than that, enjoy. 
So what we wanted to do was to build something that's very clean and simple, but has a powerful, powerful back end to it. So, you know, standard street view, grayscale, aerial view, simple. If we were in Round Rock and I clicked locate me, if you're in the city, it'll zoom in on your location, show exactly where you're at. So we've been rolling out iPads and smartphones to our utility employees. They absolutely love this. They have the entire GIS system in their smartphone wherever they go. So I live kind of down over here by the creek, and people always say, boy, you got that big creek in your backyard. Aren't you worried about flooding? Well, let's see if I should be worried about flooding. I can click on layers. We pull in data from FEMA, so I can show all of the FEMA floodplain data over that map. So we can see here's my house, here's the 500 year floodplain. If my house gets flooded, the whole city's underwater. There's lots more problems than, than me being worried about my house. And all of this data can be mashed up together. So if I want to see uh, FEMA floodplain data and see how it affects parks. So up here we have Reb Park. So I'll turn on parks. So we can see here's a park and this park, if it had a 500 year flood, that park's gonna be underwater. So very quick, someone could ask you a question, hey, is that park in the floodplain? I can pull out my smartphone, zoom in on the park, turn on the FEMA layers and answer questions. Our utility folks love this. And you can really get down into, into, the, uh, into the minutia. So <clears throat> one area that we wanted to push on too was we do big projects, right? You're, all your communities are spending lots of money around town and people never know what's going on. They just see, boy, there's a lot of construction over there and the city is annoying. What are they doing? And they've been doing it forever. So we've worked on bringing our utility projects into our GIS system. So I'll turn off those FEMA layers. We'll zoom out. Theoretically, we'll see so here's some of the projects that are going on. So if I click on that project, it'll get you more information. I think we're just running a little laggy. But so here you can see, here's a big project going on in town. Another great thing is I get a lot of questions and sitting in the director's meeting, I always look like the know-it-all, but I guess that's okay. Someone will say, so there's the, just a little bit slow, so there's the, uh, information on that project. So we can see the budget amount, where the funding's coming from, who the engineer is, when the start and completion dates are, opens up a lot of that information for people in the community. So we're, I'm, you know, there's always the discussion of how big is the square footage of XYZ property or how big is this parcel. So here for City Hall, we have our tools menu. I can do a measure. We want to do area in square feet. I can find out the square footage of City Hall it is 10,989 square feet per floor. You can do that on a smartphone or you can do that on a, on a tablet. So just something I want to show just from last year, I said this was an area that we were going to go and explore and work on. And this was the, the output of that work from last year. Yeah, Leanne. Yeah, we, yes, so we've had, so we use a, a, a system from CRW called eTrackIt, and we had to go and write a data connector to pull data out and put it onto our GIS system. And we have had a pretty sophisticated GIS system for about 10 years, but the problem has always been that data is great, but it lives in the servers at City Hall. There's no way to come out and share that information with the community, and that's been the big push of ours is, Let's, let's share this information with people. There'll be more understanding of what we're doing when they can see this project's on time, but it's a long project and it's a $3 million project. And it's not just, you know, they're wanting to tear up the street just for fun. Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> we're, we, uh, our, we have a very high ISO rating. So, you're, so what's really awesome is you have this, uh, yes, you want, y'all want me to repeat the question? Kind of how was this, how was this built? Y if you have a GIS department, 95% chance they're using Esri and they're using ArcGIS server. 
And those systems have awesome APIs that probably just sit there and nobody does very much with them. So we took advantage of using uh, those APIs that were available. Esri also publishes a lot of templates. That's what I showed last year was these free templates. I built a map mashup in about an hour using some of our data, some Flickr data, and some uh, Twitter data. So they have a great resource of templates. So if you're kind of on the web end of the side, open up a discussion with your IT folks and specifically your GIS folks to get those uh, endpoints. And then you could use a template and you could start to get, get stuff out there pretty quick. And, and I'll get more into mapping stuff in a minute. So if you like that, then you'll be in heaven in a minute. If you don't like it, then you're probably going to hate me. So kind of going back to, uh, to Google Maps. Who here uses Google Maps? Pretty much everybody. Everybody in your community uses Google Maps. That was the big fight that we had internally for a long time with our GIS department was trying to get it to the point where we can build tools that look more like Google Maps. Google Maps is inaccurate, you know, blah, you go through that whole rigmarole. Well, who's using it? Everyone. So it's an important spot. Last year, if you remember, I talked about Google Map Maker. That is still a very important resource in your community. If you see streets and Google Maps that are wrong, Go into Google Map Maker, you can fix it. It gets peer edited and your streets will, will be correct. Um, and those edits tend to happen much faster now. More and more people are, are using that technology. So what I wanna talk about today is there's a new interface on the way. How many people knew that Google Maps was doing a new interface? Probably nobody. They announced it two weeks ago at their conference, which is kind of a inside baseball Google, Google conference. It's a huge change, it's a sea change, and it's gonna really affect your communities in an extremely positive way, in my opinion, but it's gonna be more, more work for you. And I'll walk through what, what that means. Uh, they're gonna surface much more information on these pages that get auto-created. So on your websites, uh, government websites are indexed very high by, by Google, right? You're the official source of information about your community. So if you have parks and rec pages on your website, they probably have addresses. And the, the robot monster of Google in the sky has indexed those pages, knows that it's kind of like, this is a park, kind of, sort of, based on some algorithms, sees that address, and they've auto-created a Google place for that park. You as a government entity, you can go and claim that page, you can put in photos, videos, hours, all kinds of information, and if you don't, it kind of sits there doing its thing potentially giving out wrong information. They had originally indexed our uh, water park a number of years ago with the wrong phone number. So people would be trying to call the water park, they're calling a random employee at the city who just happened to have their phone number like on the footer of the page or, or somehow Google got it. You could go, we were able to go and claim that page, change the phone number, and now everything is everything's smooth sailing. So uh, those place pages, and I've, spoken about this in the past, it's more important than ever to start claiming those places, and it's extremely uh, painful to do so. It's a pain in the butt. There's two ways to claim a place. You can claim it by phone number. Lots of these parks on those pages didn't have a phone number, and so if there was no phone, no phone number or record attributed to it, you have to claim it by getting a postcard mailed. I have some postcards that got mailed in 2009 that I'm still waiting to see and I've <laughs> requested them to get, get sent again because lots of times these parks have addresses but they don't have mailboxes. So who knows where they come from or who they go to. I've kind of tried to uh, ruffle the feathers at Google a number of times about this, even talking with uh, Marissa Meyer when she was in charge of all their geolocation stuff a number of years ago and it's been very difficult to get somebody to pay attention. It's, it's hard to find a person at Google. It's very easy to find data, but it's hard to find a person. It's just a big robot. Could you possibly like the park and give the parks and recreation name number? So if it's not already there, you can't give it, right? So uh, I've, if I come up with a good way to trick it, then, then I'll try and find a way to trick it and I'll share it with you. The, the, the big thing for us is, um, if it does have the Parks and Rec main number and you have an auto attendant, you know, thank you for calling the city of Round Rock Parks and Rec Department, it won't work that way either. So now that I'm in IT and I'm in charge of the phone system, I can redirect those phone numbers to come to my desk so it makes it easier to, to claim. So the, you could make the Parks and Rec main line come to your desk for 
30 seconds to get that and take down the pin number and claim it. So you might have to have a little coordination to get those, get those places claimed. So I'm going to pop over and show what the new Google Maps interface looks like. So here we are in College Station. They have kind of the concept of cards, if you're familiar with Android. So when you type a search in the top left, it'll pop down these cards. But the important thing I want to talk about is, see all these parks? Lick Creek, Pebble Creek, Southern Oaks, Wolfpin. Those were auto-created by Google, and those create place pages that whoever is the PIO in the city of College Station can go and claim those places and put more rich information. You notice I have put no search in the box. I am at a very far out zoom level, and this is what Google is saying is important. These are the places. It's not, it's not the, uh, the McDonald's and it's not the Burger Kings when there's no information in. It's your parks. I think that's super cool. This is a lot of great promotion for those uh, parks that you'll have in your community, but the information could be wrong, so you'll want to go and, and check those out. So I'll walk through real quick what it looks like to claim a place. So you'll see Wolf Pin Creek Park. This was scraped from College Station's website. So if I click on that, that'll go to the Wolf Pin Creek Park uh, page on, uh, on College Station's website. If you click down here in Reviews, You'll see we're back to that Google Plus sort of familiar interface that we looked at a second ago. This is an auto-created place page that is this year business. You can come and claim this page. So here, it doesn't look like there's any incorrect information, but this could really be built out to show wonderful photos of people having fun, hours at, at the park all kinds of uh, rich video content if you have that available. And that was got to by going to a default view of College Station and of the four parks on there clicking one. Tons of people will drive uh, to these places. <clears throat> I don't want to get too deep into it. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you claim a place, you get all kinds of awesome metrics too based on that place. So you can, so for Round Rock, we've claimed the library. Roughly 2,000 people a day see information on a Google search result about our library by simply typing the word library into Google. That's data that you would never have access to if you didn't claim that place page. What they also do is if people request driving directions to your library, they show you the zip codes that they're coming from for that place page. So you might see boy, half of the people asking for directions from the library are on this side of town, but not so many from over here. So maybe we want to do some more marketing over here, or maybe we need to look at putting a branch over here. I mean, you know, you can extrapolate all kinds of uh, different things you might want to do, but if you don't have that data, it becomes very difficult to, uh, to decide what you want to do. Yes, sir? Real basic question. Do you need to have a Google account in order to claim here? Yes, you do. Yep. So if we wanted to claim this one, we'd go manage this page. I can say I want to edit my business information. You can put it in and then down at the bottom. So, here, so here's an example of all the information that we could put in. We could put in a phone number, an email address, the website, description, categories for the page, hours of operations. You could, if your park's open at 6 to midnight, you could put in that information. If you have a water park that's closed, on Sundays, you could make sure it's listed as closed so people don't go to Google and see it as open and try and come to your water park and get mad at you. Photos, videos, all kinds of, all kinds of details. Now, when you try and submit information, it's going to verify who you are, and it'll say this won't be published until you get the postcard with the PIN number and, and put it in. So that's when the, the waiting game begins. But if there's any extremely incorrect information in the base map, so if this, for example, was Dartmouth Avenue and not Dartmouth Street, you would use Google Map Maker and you could go in and that would get peer reviewed and changed. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you said you had to have a Google account. Um, is that your personal account that you've got up there? That's just who I'm logged in as. We have one for, so. You have Google Mail. Is that counted as Google account? Yeah, yeah, you'll have access to all this, all this stuff, yeah. Yep. 
and your, we your website will have Google Analytics on it. Everybody does. And to have Google Analytics, you have to have a Google account already. So we leverage that same account for doing most of our so stuff like that. Yeah, if you have Google Apps for government, then yeah. yeah, you get all this stuff. And you probably have a human contact you could talk to and tell them to fix all this stuff. Absolutely. Yes, your city hall would probably be on there, but you could, you could, you would definitely want to go and add city hall. So we had Play for All Abilities Park open in Round Rock. Uh, they had a grand opening on a Saturday. I went in Saturday morning, 7 a.m., drew the polygon, put the information, a link, the hours, and within 30 minutes it was on the Google base map. So it went from not existing in Google to existing within 30, 30 minutes. It's pretty cool. So kind of c continuing down the, uh, the maps front, how many people are familiar with OpenStreetMap? Cool. Uh, so OpenStreetMap is, think of it kind of like open source Google Maps. It's a big data set that anybody can contribute to, like a wiki. Anybody can add their, uh, their map points and map information. It's pretty much the world, it's uh, everybody mapping the world together, I think is kind of their, their, their marketing. It's really cool stuff. And when Google started to charge for uh, heavy users of their platform, kind of the four squares, the flickers, those types of people in the world, a lot of people left Google Maps. They didn't want to pay for that service, and they have contributed a lot of effort and time into OpenStreetMap. So, for example, Apple, Flickr, many others use OpenStreetMap open data, among others. And then companies come along like Mapbox. And what they want to do is take that data and make it beautiful, make it accessible, make it look really, really cool. So if you're a communicator, you know, a lot of times you'll ask for a map from your GIS department and it looks like it came out of the dot matrix printer, right? It's like the black lines and you kind of go, thanks guys, and, and everybody, everybody goes away. And then I've seen a lot of people, you know, they're going and they're doing uh, screenshots off of, uh, of Google Maps itself to, to share maps, to, you know, put as a still image on, on a web page just, you know, because it, might just look more friendly than what you're going to get from your, from your GIS department. So what you can get using Mapbox is really beautiful maps. And I'll show a demo a little, in a second of what that means. The problem in the past with a lot of these technologies was they would do uh, base tile, which are the, you know, just the, um, when, you're, when you're loading on Google Maps, you know, there's like a little blank square and then it pops in. That's a tile. When I say tile, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Those tile updates for Mapbox used to happen once a month, and that was pretty good. Now they happen once every five minutes. So if I go and make a change on a street, and I'm using their base tiles in a mobile app, for people out in the real world, within five minutes, they'll get the new updated information in their phone, and you have a lot more control over how that stuff looks. So here's OpenStreetMap. Looks very much like Google Maps. This is actually really ugly looking, but this shows all of the, all of the data. And when I zoom in here on downtown Round Rock, I went in recently and said, hey, these buildings have names. Let's put the building names on them. So when people come in and look at the maps we're using, they'll understand what the Nelson Hardware building means. They might even go, what does the Nelson Hardware building mean, and Google it and find more about the history of Round Rock and what this building has meant to the community just based on trying to find something on a map somewhere. I think, to me, kind of that serendipitous way of getting your community information out in front of people without feeling like you're doing your cheesy marketing is, uh, can be very valuable. Not that your marketing is cheesy. Never. So Mapbox is a company I mentioned earlier. They got a grant from the Knight Foundation to build an editor. So the editing tools uh, are really coming a long way. So if we wanted to come and add some information to this map, see, I'm logged in, there's nothing special. You could have an account created in five minutes and be able to do what I'm doing here. Edit with ID. And then it's gonna walk you through how to use this tool the first time. So if you go through the walkthrough, it takes about 10 minutes, you'll be pretty much an expert at using this tool. 
I'm going to skip that and just uh, give you a quick, quick view. So you can see here's these buildings that we've added. So if I come to City Hall and click on it, here's the name of the building, City Hall. It's the type public building. Make sure that we get the right address information in there. If you really want to, you can go as far as putting in elevations, building heights, phone number. We don't have our phone number. We'll put in City Hall phone number. Hey, slacker, come on. <laughs> Will, what's your phone number? 218-5409. <laughs> so we'll go in. We're going to add the telephone number. Close that box, and you'll see you have a little save information up here. And once I click save, it's going to say, what's the commit message? What, what did you do? What are you changing? Added phone number for City Hall. So that simple to add a phone number to, to City Hall. If you needed to come and add a street, so let's come and let's just wreck shop. We'll put a street here. We'll put a street there. There we go. We've done some really genius. And that's going to be a rail station. Now, that's a subway. You just made the city attorney really mad. I just built a subway right through the city attorney's <laughs> office. <laughs> and it's going to be a aerial tunnel. Say again? How do we determine aerial lines? We're looking at our city and just looking at the street. Oh, in the editing tool? Zoom in. Once you zoom in, it'll go to the uh, aerial, or if you click edit. So here I've made a gross mistake, right? I'm going to back it out, and it's gone. So that's something if you're interested in, you're looking around open street maps. We had some streets that were kind of aligned weird, and I'm an enthusiast at this stuff. There's a couple people in my department that are interested in maps, and every now and again we'll just look and go and, and fix stuff. And people in your community are already already doing this. So if I get, go back to the view menu, I, I'm a super nerd, right? So I think this is really cool. Somebody has come and modeled our pool. They've put in like the chemical buildings. They've put in the, that this is concrete and that this is water. They've put in the little shack for our dog park and modeled the big dog area and the small dog area. There's people in your community that are doing a great community service right now of adding to these tools. So Whenever, you know, for me, whenever I can, I go and just, just check up on the data because it's going somewhere and it's information about your community that your residents or people visiting your community are using either just out of pure interest or, or to get around town. So these are great tools to, uh, to stay up on. Anybody have any more open street map questions? Yeah. They have a commit history, so it's very much like Wikipedia. So if someone goes and they are becoming a nuisance to the community, you can find out, find out pretty quick. So it's kind of, you know, if you're, if you're real uptight about like, just make sure all this data is right, this isn't the right spot for you, which is kind of weird for me being in IT to say, to say that. I don't care, you know, if it's wrong, we'll, we'll go and fix it or somebody will fix it. And if someone's wrecking, wrecking shop in there, then, you know, there's ways to, to deal with that too. So, so part of the, I guess, fail state bed is you probably, this, this isn't some place where you're going to expect a lot of, you know, back and forth, you know, revisionism or anything. It's, you know, you, who, who, what weirdos want to go in and change the phone number to City Hall? Kind of. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're kind of relying on the, on the goodness of the collective, right? I mean, same reason you, that someone's not spray painting City Hall every night or burning down buildings through your city. Could they do it? Sure. Yeah. Bruce, yes. Are you over IT? Uh, sorry, are you over GIS? Yes. Sure.
Sure, and, it, and it's, a, it's a matter of having time to do the work. So our GIS, I mean, a lot of the work that they do isn't truly understood. I mean, they're, they're planning address points and doing parcel data and all, all of that stuff. So when you go and say, you know, stop what you're doing and fix this stuff in a system that people may not be using, they can get grumpy about it. But there's people on my staff that have embraced this and they go and they, they look for the information because, because we care. Now, does it, is this the uh, production data that we're gonna use for utility line locates and information like that? Absolutely not. That's why we invest in that other system. But what's really great about these technologies and the uh, Esri API is now I can start to mash up the different, different layers of stuff. So City View, that is completely accurate uh, information straight out of our GIS system. Um, that is kind of the, the Bible of information for the city of Round Rock. But is everybody going to go to City View to find their way around town? Absolutely not. If I need to make a map for uh, art installations in downtown Round Rock, do I need to have that you know, be, uh, uh, be able to be ground truth to a foot in the city of Round Rock? No. So let's use the right technologies at the, at the right time. But what's really cool is that GIS data can now come out just layer by layer. So if I wanted to do a Google Maps mashup with parks information out of our GIS system, I could do that. Is anybody gonna get killed if that park is off by a meter? No. Are, am I cool with that? Absolutely. Let's put it in a friendly format that people can use. And if we wanna get uptight about it not being perfectly accurate, then we'll deal with that. But I, I think that's been an area that we have had uh, had strong discussions about, and uh, and and they've been fun, and we're doing cool stuff. Is there? Are you, what are you doing with your interface from the from the uh, S3 API? Uh, uh, is that marketable? Can other cities? Uh, would that be something that, uh, because of the structure of the of GIS system, is that something other cities could possibly take advantage of? Yeah, absolutely. So in a lot, of, a lot of our stuff, we start with templates, and we try and use open source technologies. So for doing the adaptive scaling, we use, uh, Twitter has open sourced a framework called Bootstrap. So pretty much we're using Bootstrap and the Esri API. Most data processing is done client side, so there's not too much secret magic that we're doing. But that's kind of been, that's, to me, that would be like the next step, right, of how do we start to open source and share some of these tools Frankly, I don't care about looking cool about this stuff. I care about people getting the information of where they need to go. And if Round Rock has done 90% of the work and you could plug in a big piece of it, that would be awesome on the understanding that everybody doing awesome stuff, we could share and build that. That's, that's right, that's, that's a great ideal. Uh, has, have we gotten to that point yet? Not really. That'd be, that'd, be a that'd be a big sea change in the way stuff gets done. What would be cool? Okay, thanks for hanging in there, moving forward. So Mapbox, this is, okay, so OpenStreetMap is kind of the nerdy data inside of it. Mapbox is how you can pull that information out and make it look really pretty, really quick for your website. So if you wanted to, so here in this little demo, I wanted just the buildings to be yellow, the ground to be green, and the streets to be white. So if that fit in with the colors of your website and you wanted to show off your new splash pad, and have that mesh in with your site really nice, you could do that very simply. And you'll notice that the buildings here, those are the, that, this is the, uh, the base data coming from OpenStreetMap. So that was where I added those building names and uh, they're popped up right on the map there for people to see. So I'll hop into Mapbox real quick. So I started a map, I guess yesterday, just called Food in College Station. <laughs> so if you know College Station's website, they kind of, maybe they had like a monotone look or you know, this is very different looking than, uh, than Google Maps or Bing Maps. Um, there's some styling capabilities within those, but this one is really built for it. So let me see if we come here and edit. So here's the streets. If you're familiar with Photoshop, you have your hue, saturation, alpha. So if we wanted to make these buildings look just like hot pink. So there you go. Now you have those hot pink buildings in your map. And we want to change ground areas to like this 
funky purple that's a little bit transparent. So very quick, you can come in here and start um, editing the way a map looks. And this is using the OpenStreetMaps data. And these are just base tiles. So if you're uh, um, developer oriented, you can bring this into uh, Leaflet or another um, uh, mapping API to put your points on top of. So these could just be serving your, your base tiles. That's probably gibberish to most people and that's okay. But within this tool, if you don't want to add these points programmatically, you just want to add them yourself, you can come to their tile tool. Let's add a new marker. Let's make it yellow. Somebody tell me a restaurant in College Station. Doesn't matter what. Chewy's. Chewy's, okay. Started in Austin. So we're going to add our Chewy's, and we want to put Chewy's is here on the corner. And there's your Chewy's, and you have the pop-up that says, yum, here's Republic Steakhouse, Grub Burgers. So, okay, we're happy with our changes. Let's save those changes. And you have some control over the, uh, the buttons that show up on the map. So if we just wanted to lock it down and not have people be able to zoom in and out, you could turn off the zoom controls just to keep it like on your downtown area or wherever you want it. We'll leave those on, save them, publish this map. So doing that, we adjusted the colors of the streets to make it how we want it. We put the markers in, and this is the embed code for your website. It's just an iframe code. You're not, you don't have to monkey with anything too difficult. So we have the iframe here. And I'll just make a quick page so you see this isn't me inventing stuff. Yes. The Sagan. Like a still still image option, I haven't I haven't looked at that. We'll we'll pop back in a second and check it out. The real but on kind of on the resolution front, the really cool thing about Mapbox is that the tiles are all Retina friendly. So if you use an iPad or a newer device with really high resolution, it, the maps look really great on those devices. I'm sure you could probably put it out at whatever resolution you want. We'll we'll check that in a second. So we paste it in our embed code. We'll call it Tamio test. Open this page we just created, and there's our pretty map that we just made. So it's got custom colors, neat, vibrant markers, very simple, easy to use when you hover over it. You got your information, uh, and, and that's pretty, pretty simple. So I know a lot of times when people are making maps, you want them to look, look nice. I mean, you're doing something simple like this. You want it to look nice, fit in with the color scheme of your site, and have those markers. Somebody with you know, no real uh, technical background could come, fiddle with it until you get it right. It'll take, take some time, and then put your markers on it, and, and off you go. That's a good question. Yeah. I don't know the I don't know the answer to that. That's a cool idea though. And in the new Google Maps, they do have the rotation tool to move the rotation around. So, if you're interested in that, you might want to use that. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the cool thing is now there's so many technologies you go, well, this is a requirement for my project. Okay, well, we'll trade off having the purple streets for being able to orient the map properly. Okay, enough already with this map stuff. <laughs> Let's talk about something else. I love that picture. I, it's like we were watching a, a lot of Boardwalk Empire. So this was, Blaze went to a party as Nucky Thompson, so. <laughs> okay, I didn't get to talk about this yesterday. Is anybody familiar with what this is on the screen? 3D printer, there we go. So. We, okay, so I didn't, I didn't get to cover this in the Better Than Beer Money, so I figured it was cool enough that I'd cover it 
cover it today. We use peg funds to buy this 3D printer. We bought it uh, last week, right? Yeah, I got it on Monday. I yeah, I, I didn't tell Brian. Brian. It was news to Brian. Uh, so this is our, our 3D printer that we bought with peg funds. 3D printer, if you're not familiar, it's where you can model objects in uh, 3D software and print them in plastic and make them reality. So I'll, I'll send this comb around. This is like, this was the first thing I printed, so I'm super proud of my comb. Yeah. So if you ever see me like walking around with a comb, it's very, <laughs> very cool. So you're probably wondering, okay, peg funds, come on, that's a, that's a, that's a stretch, right? Okay. So for, for the quadcopter now, or for any of our cameras, you know, you always have weird mounting situations you get into, especially with GoPros. They're small cameras. You gotta try and come up with, uh, with ways to, to mount them. So here I'm printing out, it's called an anti-jello device. On the quadcopter, it vibrates pretty hard, so the video can shake a little bit. You can fix that in software pretty well, but Brian and I have kind of been on the quest to make it so we get as good video as possible. We've bought moon gels, which are uh, drummers use to uh, stop the reverb on their drums. We've tried that, those work pretty good. And this is kind of the, the next step of, step of that. So you have a base plate that goes on the camera and then a mount that goes, uh, uh, you have a base plate that goes on the quadcopter and a mount that goes on the camera and then it's held by some real strong rubber O-rings so it takes some of, the, some of the vibration out. I didn't design this. There's a really cool website called The Thingiverse. People share their designs that they make and you can essentially just download them and print them. So if you're using GoPros, there's like 2,000 different weird GoPro mounts that you could get and download from, from their site. So here's kind of a close up view of, of the parts I printed. We print the Thingiverse, T-H-I-N-G-I-V-E-R-S-E, Thingiverse. That's why you come to the Brooks Show. <laughs> like so I think we're probably one of the few people that are playing with 3D printers right now. They're, uh, but it's a, it's a new technology. Um, it's, uh, they're a little, they're not ready for prime time yet, but they're getting there and the prices are dropping in the technology. So it could be the case where uh, 3,000 bucks. So not incredibly expensive, but it costs, costs some money. Yes? You're mounting GoPros to quadcopters? Yes. yes. How are you using the quadcopters? How, How aerially? <laughs> How are we, so like uh, we've flown some of the, uh, we had a centennial celebration recently. So Brian got some good photos of our amphitheater aerial. So a lot of those uh, crane shots that you would spend a lot of time setting up a crane for or buying a crane for or having operators. Or if you ever needed aerial photography, Brian covered this pretty well yesterday. It's extremely expensive to hire uh, someone to shoot aerials of your city. So if we wanted to get down by the round rock and do a nice fly down of the creek, we could do that with a quadcopter. Even if every time we went out, we crashed it and ruined it, it would be cheaper than hiring somebody to go fly that every time we, we needed it. We don't crash it every time we fly it. We have crashed them a few times though. But we don't fly, it, we don't fly them over uh, people's houses or areas. You know, we have a pretty strong set of rules for when, when we will operate those, those cameras. They're really fun too. So how many people have heard of public stuff? How many people's communities are using public stuff? Cool. So public stuff, uh, and this is probably going to be the closest to a shameless plug that I give anybody today. But, you know, and I've talked in, I think, the past two years of, you know, we all want to try and get into the app stores, right? Lots of people are downloading apps, but, man, it's expensive, and it's kind of a, it's a pain. I mean, there's cities that are spending tons and tons of money to do this. If you want to develop it in-house natively, get out your checkbooks, because you're going to have to write big checks to people to develop these apps. The technology advances so quickly that there's going to be new versions you've got to keep up with, so you're going to continually have to, have to pay those folks to develop those apps. So what most people are doing is they're wrapping their apps, they're coding them using web technologies, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then they're wrapping it up 
to ship on, onto those app, app stores. What public stuff has done that's really cool is they're a citizen reporting app. Everybody knows the citizen reporting apps. Everyone, you know, apparently there's just like potholes all over the planet that everybody wants to report, like all day just reporting potholes. Everybody wants to report potholes. So you see the, the top two um, little widgets up there, those are what come baked into public stuff. But what they give you is a framework for coding your own widgets to, to put into their system. Most communities are just putting in their mobile-friendly web pages, and they're going in there, and that's, that's really cool. That's, that's great. That's a step in the, in the right direction. But what public stuff has is they have a great uh, framework for building these mobile-friendly widgets to go in. So I'm going to switch to my iPhone real quick. Preface all of this on we're not a paying customer of public stuff. They've just given us access to the system to test out stuff because we've been working for so long to get into the app stores and really trying to be as smart as possible because it's one of those things, once you get in there, you're in there. And once you start writing checks, you're going to need to keep, keep writing checks. And we wanted to be able to have a partner that had um, technology where we could update the apps, we could build new tools and add them and roll them out and have them go out to people in our community without waiting to pay somebody, somebody else to do it. So here's the, uh, the main screen. Y'all can see that good. You, know, you can swipe through. So if I wanted to see, if I wanted to pay a utility bill, I can click on bill pay. And then now I can make a municipal court or a utility bill payment from your smartphone. Now what's really cool is we have lots of services that we contract for, right? Your financial system, you might be using Tyler Technologies or Info or somebody, and they probably have a mobile-friendly payment version now. But you can bring that, uh, that mobile view into one spot. So to me, it kind of helps with the marketing problem, right? If you go out and you do, well, now we need a parks and rec app, and now we need a municipal court utility bill payment app, and now we need, you know, next thing you know, you just have so many apps. How are you marketing these for people to download it? The magic bullet to me would be to have one app in the app store that most of your stuff is being done through, and you have the ability to change that very rapidly and add new features. And the one platform I've found so far that you can do this on and do it very quickly has been, has been public stuff. So I mentioned our city view. So now I don't have to create a city view wrapper and an app to get it in the app store to let people know about it. I can just market people to download Round Rock. I just, this default name that I put in, just Round Rock on the go. So go to the app store, download Round Rock on the go, and you can get city view. So then somebody's out and about, they click on city view, and then you have the full GIS system right there in your pocket. And it remembers the last layers you had on. So I had on the FEMA and parks data. So if I ever want to open it again, locate myself, all I got to remember is go to that one app and, and here it is. The recycle date, this one is like the killer app to me. And Google made some changes to, the, uh, to their API. And I wasn't able to update it to have a working demo right now. But the concept to me is, uh, is really cool because I constantly forget what my recycle date is. We do trash weekly, recycling bi-weekly. And every, every Tuesday night I'm going, e, is it green can night or is it not? So if you have this, you put in your neighborhood and it remembers it for eternity. And when I open up my phone, when I pull home on Tuesday, I can click recycle date and it'll show your recycling date is tomorrow with a big number of, of the date on your, on your screen. So that's the other thing that we've been trying to think of before we launch something is what are these, what are these killer apps, what are these little killer widgets that people are really going to want to go out and get that's going to be very useful information to them about what's going on in the community. And uh, then you know, they'll have a driver to go and download the app and maybe get some information, check out our, our videos. So our video widget, this is ingesting data from the YouTube API. So whenever Brian publishes a video, it, it comes in here. So if I wanted to play the Centennial Celebration, I could just click that, and it'll send us to YouTube to play that video. 
So if you could give them a reason to download it, maybe the recycling information is a driver for them to get it, and now they constantly have the newest updated video information about your community in their pocket. Just another kind of sneaky way to get that content out in front of people to keep them informed. You know, Will always says kind of the dirty little secret is people don't care a whole lot about what we do, but if we can give them kind of those little value adds and maybe they'll catch up on something that they didn't realize that they were gonna care about. Like if you did a promo for a big festival, people may not know about it, but when they go to check the recycling date, something they absolutely need to do, they'll see it, and that'll help build kind of you know, the, the sense of community in your towns and, and cities. So public stuff to me is, uh, is cool kind of as a framework there on the uh, iPhone, Android, and uh, soon to be Windows Mobile Store. So it kind of covers most of the platforms and they have uh, really made a push to, uh, to advance their platform and innovate on top of it. So if you haven't looked at, at public stuff or you haven't gotten into the, uh, into the uh, app store market, that's the way that we're probably leaning right now. Like I said, we can kind of control the content, roll out those features as we need to, to develop them and not have to uh, worry about huge, huge costs. They have a very reasonable pricing model, and if you'll contact someone from Public Stuff, they will tell you their pricing up front. It's based on your population. Perfect. So last year, I talked a little bit about Flickr, and Flickr's made some change. How many uh, people are using Flickr for their community? Thank you. You can't see what I can see. Thank you, Will. <laughs> so most of your communities, y'all have the pro accounts, right? $50 for, for two years. Everybody that has a pro account with the changes that happened less than a month ago. We're all grandfathered, so you have unlimited storage. You don't have to, to worry about that stuff. You don't have to worry about ads. What they have done, though, is uh, they're offering one terabyte of storage for free to anyone. So what they're trying to do would be to get more people onto uh, the Flickr platform to share their photos. Um, Marissa Meyer, she took over as a Yahoo CEO and has made a big push to fix Flickr. Flickr hadn't made many changes for the past couple of years in terms of innovation on the platform, and so they've had a big push to do that. So what one of the outcomes might be now that, so in the past you had to pay $25 a year, and that would kind of take down the 200 photo limit, which they used to have. Now there's no photo limit. So there's more of an incentive for people who don't want to spend any money to put photos into Flickr. So I see probably more and more people posting photos into Flickr, and if you're running a Flickr group, that's good for your community. That's more photos that you can invite to your group and, uh, and use in your marketing materials. How many people are running a Flickr group of any form? Is that, have y'all won? Y'all want me to cover what that means? Okay, so in Round Rock, we've had a Flickr group for a number of years. What you can do, and kind of this is the, the indicator at the bottom, is check out flickr.com slash places. If you go to flickr.com slash places and put in your city's name, it'll show you photos that have been geotagged to your city. Lots, I, I assure you there are going to be outstanding photos taken in your community. And if you have a group, you can invite those photographers to share those pictures with you. And when they share them, you can give some... Uh, uh, licensing information that says by sharing this photo with our group you agree to let us use it in our marketing materials and we will give you attribution in, uh, in, in the form of putting you know photo by whoever on the picture. We've had great successes, been probably you know the best 50 bucks for two years we've I'd dare to say ever spent. I mean we could literally spend two hours showing you all the unbelievable Redesigning our website, we have this treasure trove of free photos. Now, I mean, these are these are not kind of okay pictures. These are amazing pictures. 
uh, that we can that we will be using uh, on our new website. So if you have more questions about Flickr, feel free to send send me an email. But if you check out flickr.com slash places, that'll kind of show how many people are posting photos in your community already. So this is like my catch-all, you know. I can't talk about everything. There's tons of things going on that are super interesting and exciting to me. So I'll just briefly uh, uh, breeze over these. A couple weeks ago at uh, Google's conference, they expanded the functionality of YouTube Live to all channels with 1,000 subscribers can now broadcast live content into YouTube. If your community has 1,000 subscribers, you're awesome, and you might want to look at taking advantage of this. We don't have 1,000 subscribers yet, but I would venture to guess in the next year they're going to open this up to more and more communities. So if you're interested in streaming your council meetings live into YouTube or doing a concert series live into YouTube, uh, that technology is becoming more and more available. And to me, uh, that's really, really exciting. You know, YouTube has a great technology, great community. And being able to get your content into YouTube is a, is a good thing. Great API for pulling it out programmatically and putting it in to widgets and some of those other stuff we've done that's difficult to do with uh, certain other providers. We've leveraged Google Fusion tables a lot. It's kind of like a, a, a database in the sky that you can program against. Um, are you all familiar with Fusion tables? This is one of my favorite technologies. It's super, super cool. Um, we built something last, last, uh, last month. We had an old application where if people have like unclaimed utility bill deposits or uh, money that they're owed from the city, we have that list. So we took that list, put it into Fusion tables, and within an afternoon we had an application where you could search by your last name and see if the city owed you any money. So you can really quickly get uh, tools built uh, using Fusion Tables and their API to pull the data out. If you have more interest in that, um, I'd be happy to talk about that with you more. Another technology that has kind of a communication slant to it is SmartFile. We had an FTP server that, uh, I'm going to try not get mad about this, take a deep breath. We had an FTP server we were paying $800 a month for for moving FTP files around, just ridiculous. And, and who uses FTP and it's like a huge pain and you have to put a ticket into the IT system and somebody has to make an account and it's just a pain in the butt, right? So we're using a tool now called SmartFile. What we wanted to do was have uh, an FTP replacement that still did FTP. We have some business processes where we move files to the printer over FTP and we didn't want to change it up too much for them. But this is kind of like a combination of, uh, of Dropbox and FTP. So now if you need to move a big file to somebody one time, you can post it, send them a link, and they can download it, and you're done. So uh, that's, a, that's a cool cool technology. And then the, the, the final one that's really cool to me is Google Glass. Are you all familiar with Google Glass, like the glasses you can wear? In? So Google has their wearable computing initiative. It's a uh, pair of glasses, and in the top, there's a little heads-up display that overlays information. It might be you know, directions somewhere, text messages. You can take pictures. You would just say, OK, glass, take a picture, and it'll snap a picture of, of everybody in the room. So wearable computing, is, it's a niche now, but it'll be interesting to, to see where that technology goes. There's lots of privacy debates about it now. You know, someone can walk in with glasses and be recording everywhere. I think the big discussion that I've heard, like at Google, is, you know, are you supposed to take off your glasses when you go into the bathroom now? Because you don't, no one knows if you're like recording what's what's going on in the bathroom. So there's lots of lots of weird <laughs> privacy implications with that as well. But you know, from a PIO standpoint, if you're the the one man band PIO and you're at a press conference and you have your little glasses on, you could be snapping photos while you talk to somebody or recording video of the press conference just standing there. You know, there might be some, be some practical applications that, that go along with that. And just kind of as a consumer of technology, I'm interested to see how society picks it up and how we, how we deal with it and you know, how much it's going to cost when it, uh, when it comes out. So that's just another, another thing that uh, be uh, looking for in the next year. I think by the end of this calendar year, they're supposed to have the consumer 
version coming out. So if you've been interested in the privacy debate around the quadcopters, which has been going on, just wait for the glasses debate to, to take place. That'll be an interesting, interesting discussion. Okay, so this is my last slide, and this is my soapbox, and this is where I need you to, to help me. We need to demand access to our data from these vendors we work with. In IT, I've been in IT you know, for almost a year and a half now, and it's a challenge to get data out of some of these systems that we could be doing interesting and, uh, and thoughtful work with. So I know this isn't, uh, isn't something that we really can do, but don't do business with vendors that don't give you programmatic access to your data. Now there's a number that, that it's difficult to do that with. Give some examples. Give some examples. You want me to name names? I don't want to name names today, okay. but they're. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no, I'm not saying specific vendors, but. Okay, so like financial systems, right? So if you have a financial system, you would probably want to be able to have a, a programmatic access to that data to code a tool that does like a, a check register. Who are the checks that the city has written written in the past year? You know, there's this whole open government initiative, but generally what we're having to do is take the data, export it out into a format and then do something with it and then import it into somewhere else where this stuff should all just, just talk together. Also for being able to you know, build little widgets like that. If I had access to, to uh, financial data, I could build you know, a, a insight into a government spending widget you know, if you wanted to. So I guess my point is that this is our data and the citizens are paying for it and a lot of times they have a right to request that data and they'll do an open records request for it and we have to go through a bunch of work tracking it down and calling it and all that, all that pain to give them the information. So if it's open information and, you're, uh, and your organization doesn't have anything to hide, let's make it easy for people to get access to that and then it makes it easier for me as kind of a, a hacker on the inside, so to speak, to have access to the data to build tools out of it. So a lot of times when I want access to information, it's a challenge and then we're gonna have to go and pull it out of this system and put it in this format and then I need to upload it into fusion tables to do something with it. Where I just wanna, wanna be able to build stuff for the community to communicate what we're doing with their money. And in Round Rock, you know, we work really hard to, to spend, their, spend their money wisely. And the times where we don't spend it wisely, we buy uh, 3D printers. <laughs> Just kidding, very good use for the, for the 3D printers. So, I mean, you'll hear the, uh, the initiative at the federal, yeah, <laughs> the initiative at the federal level to have more open data, more insight, and in, uh, I think is, uh, is a good thing. There's lots of tools that we can build on top of that. Yes? They hate me. I wouldn't say older, I would just say, yeah, in general across the board. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge, but so uh, I like to look at the way the world is, is moving, right? And many of the technologies that the IT department is over, they're communication technologies, right? I mean, it's, it's email, it's networking, it's web surfing, it's uh, you know, data storage and security, not, not so much, and that's kind of the angle that they, that they come from a lot of the time. But I think the benefit that we have as government is that most of this information is open records requestable in public anyway. So, you know, you need to you need to pay strong attention to personal and private information that needs to be secure. But a lot of the other stuff, you know, we'll get into discussions about security, and I'll just go, what, what, why? You know, why does that? Why are you so worried about someone getting that data? If someone asked for that data, we would give it to them. So, the good news is now Brooks is speaking at conferences of those IT professionals that you're talking that you're talking about. So he, can't, we're real receptive to this stuff, as he says they they tend to not. I did. You know, I, they're kind of love or hate you. I guess. I did a session at the uh, TAG ITM, Texas Association of Government Information Technology Managers, kind of the IT directors version of this conference and walk them through, I, I kind of did ships passing in the night, how, what communications thinks of you and 
kind of laid laid out, you know, what I what I thought to them. And it's, you know, you're the you're the people that are perceived to say no to everything. And here's the technologies they're wanting to do. And in most cases, for me, uh, being over the IT department, I'm excited about a lot of this stuff because many of the tools, software as a service tools, the flickers of the world, people think IT is supporting that. We don't do anything for that. I give you, a, I give you an internet connection and you're putting stuff on Flickr or using Google Maps and people think I do that. That's great. I get, I get you know, and that's what I've, I've told them as well is you guys should be partnering up on this because you can mutually make each other look good and do great things. And that's, you know, that's what we're here for. I think some of the challenge too, and communication has happened like since the dawn of time, right? Sitting around a fire as cave people and we're discussing and learning to communicate. Technology in its current form isn't really that, that old. And so we're still trying to figure out as a society how we deal with this stuff, what's, what's appropriate. And, and the tools are gonna constantly change and stuff is gonna move faster and faster. So if you're living in a world of no, you're gonna, the wave is gonna crash on you very quick and you're gonna get replaced. Boom! And on that note, <laughs> this year's So we've got lunch uh, starting at noon, followed by...